Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. This is the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all corners of Canada. Now, today we are honored to be sitting down and speaking with Horn Payne Mayor Cheryl Ford. Nestled within the vast expanse of the northern Ontario's boreal forest lies the quaint township of Hornpain, a charming settlement primarily sustained by its railway and lumber mill industries. Surrounded by rugged landscapes and teeming with lakes and rivers, it offers a serene retreat seldom found in more populated southern regions of Ontario. Now, renowned as a haven for outdoor enthusiasts, Hornpain beckons hunters and fishermen alike, drawn by the allure of its untouched wilderness. The area boasts an abundance of wildlife, including the majestic moose and the elusive black bear, providing ample opportunities for avid photographers to capture nature's splendors. During the winter months, snowmobile enthusiasts flock to the region, taking advantage of the extensive snowmobile trail system. Horn Payne serves as a vital hub along the Canadian National Railway line. Strategically positioned midway between Toronto and Winnipeg, regular via passenger train service operates three times weekly, connecting the township to destinations across the country, facilitating seamless travels coast to coast. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Mayor Cheryl Fort. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Mayor Ford, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the person behind the mayor's position a little bit. And I want to start by asking the question I've asked every single person who's ever come on this show. So you're no exception to that rule. Uh, so the question is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Mayor Ford? Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for inviting me on and uh, giving me this opportunity. I love highlighting my community. Um, my passion for community actually comes from being living in the north and being a long life northern Ontario resident. Um, I started out uh, helping my community. I was a school board trustee. I did uh, some organizing for uh, an annual Christmas party that we host here in Horn Pain. I was heavily involved with my children when they were growing up within the community through sports and events and their uh, music lessons, and of course, their schooling. But in all of that experience, I never saw myself going on council. I did uh, sit on the library board, was the library board chair. And uh, it was at that time that I started seeing that, you know, maybe I can help at that level. So it really comes from a passion for community. I really want to see people thrive. And I enjoy watching people succeed. So um, and I hope that through my success, that encourages more women, especially in Indigenous women, to try different things. Was politics discussed at the dinner table growing up? Or No, <laughs> politics was not discussed at the dinner table at all. Um, and still today, I'm... I'm not what, uh, you know, totally hooked on everything that's happening in the political realm. I really am more focused on what does my community need and and where do I find the information to make that happen? So, um, so it's really a grassroots kind of approach that I have. It's not, I'm not seeing big policy that, oh, I need to have that changed. It's more for... Uh, my own personal experience when I've been dealing with services in our community at the front end, and I realize, you know what, this doesn't quite work. And then I do the background and find out how do we change this? How do we make it better? What do we need for a community to thrive and be sustainable into the long term? And that's really how I go after my information. I'm I'm not led by media 
at all because I rarely turn on any kind of uh, news or TV. I, I've joked, <laughs> my mother watches the news quite often and she'll tell me what's happening. Actually, I just got off the phone with her because friends we um, known from our hometown where I originally grew up in Nikina, someone won $2 million there. <laughs> That's so, a big thing for a small community. Yes, yes. So, um, so I, I want to. You, you say you were a school board trustee prior to becoming a counselor, and if correct me if I'm wrong here, but you first got elected through a by-election in 2016 in your community, correct? That that's correct. Yes, there okay. was a there was a council vacancy, and uh, four of us went for the seat, and I was. Uh, I, I got chosen for the seat. So that was great. And so okay, you, you, you said chosen. I don't want to make sure I'm asking this correctly well, because Ontario is the weirdest province when it comes to vacancies from time to time. Were you appointed yeah. by council or were, did you run in a by-election? Uh, it was appointment by council. So it wasn't a full by-election. They did. Uh, so they passed a bylaw and then we followed that procedure. So we all presented to council and then it was a vote and there was actually a tie and we ended up having to draw a name between myself and one other, one other person. Okay. There, there's a million questions I have right now, but I've got to ask, <laughs> how, how do you feel when you get appointed by the people who you are going to now sit around the table with? Because, uh, I can imagine it's nerve wracking because you get to see democracy unfold and you're seeing these people vote for you or against you as things unhappen. Can you take me through this process? Because you're one of the few people who have had this opportunity to actually be appointed to a council position instead of being elected to a council position. Okay. Well, it was my first, uh, um, real challenge against policy that I didn't agree with. So uh, a little bit of history here. We had a meeting at the end of August where all four candidates presented. And because of my name, I was the presenter first. And then every person that presented actually got to stay in the room after and listen. So, um, and all the councillors got to, and the mayor at the time got to ask questions. And uh, so I got to watch the process from beginning to end. And in the end of that day, uh, or that meeting, they all voted and uh, it became a tie between two of us and nothing else changed except they all knew who voted for who. And uh, they voted again. And one of the members changed their vote in favor of the other candidate. And I, I was completely disappointed because um, I was prepared. I was the first one in, I had a lot of experience. And um, later that evening, when I went home, I, I read the bylaw and I said, you know, I think you uh, misinterpreted your own bylaw. You should have we should have cast lots, basically, and chosen at that point, or we should have had the opportunity to address council again. So there was some choice. Um, so <laughs> they they agreed. And <laughs> uh, the, the two of us came back on September the 7th. And um, yeah, and we cast lots at that time and they followed the procedure that way. And, um, and I was uh, it, appointed. It's, it's council, why so. municipalities have procedures and bylaws. It's a weird concept, but you should be following them, everyone. Um, yes, yes. And I have to give a shout out though, because the four candidates that ran at that time, I know all of them and uh, I appreciate all of them. Two of them sat on my council last uh, term and uh, one is still currently sitting on my council. And um, the person that was in the draw that with me, he supports me solidly. And he's actually was really pleased that I got on council, like after I started doing the work. And and he's still currently one of my counselors. So I give a shout out to counselor Peter Kistemaker. Um So two years later, well, a year and a half later, I would say, because September 2016 to uh, October 2018 is a very quick turnaround time you decide or do you get tapped on the shoulder to run for mayor what what draws you into that mayor's position a little bit 
Yeah. So um, I had no aspirations to run for mayor originally. I was uh, just really focused. The learning curve was steep because you're coming into a council halfway through a term. I was very thankful, though, that I got one on one counselor training with um, Fred Dean at the beginning of December of 2016, which was amazing. I didn't even realize at the time um, just what the opportunity was for me to have that one on one with him. So, and he also, you know, uh, reiterated that you get the most done by following your policy, writing good policy and uh, putting it into practice. So it started probably about um, one year in, people started really asking me, are you looking at running? I, I was well known in the community because I had run that uh, annual Christmas party for the community and people had watched me raise my children. They knew what I was about. So there was a real appetite for change at that time too. And, and then from my experience being on council as a counselor, I really felt that my, uh, I just, I, I was having difficulty presenting ideas without bringing offense. I don't know if it was because I was the new kid on the block and I had different ideas. And, and I asked some tough questions right off the bat. Like, I was like, where's our strategic plan? Like, where are you? What are you doing? And so I probably set some people, you know, put their backs up, which is fine. But I think as an elected official, you need to do that sometimes. And I've done that on other boards that I sit on, like, I, I don't like just, uh, you know, floating downstream without a paddle. And I look at st uh, strategic plans and knowing where you're going and mapping it out is our paddles, right? And we have to, we have to sometimes guide ourselves through currents that we don't know are coming. So now you've been on council for about eight years now, coming up onto your eighth year in office uh, in September. Um, and I can imagine you've had to make some very tough choices over those, those eight years in office, what do you do to prepare yourself to go in to make those tough choices? Because as the local level of governance, you are the closest to the people. You impact their day-to-day -day lives more often than provincial or even federal governance. Definitely. How important is it for you to be prepared every time you walk into that council meetings? And what do you do to prepare yourself to make those tough choices for the betterment of the community? Yeah, so there's a lot of work in the background that goes into um, before you sit at the council table and people see me there. So in the beginning, uh, like I said, there was a lot to learn. So I would read the agenda packages thoroughly. And then from that, I would probably spend, I would say, anywhere upwards of 10 hours reading other documents that were referred to or what is this and trying to figure out how it fits together. Now it's a it's a bit easier for me, of course, with eight years experience. I have that background of knowledge of what the ministries are or what the um, items are of certain groups that are looking at moving their um, agendas forward so but still our council packages are quite extensive I we were just having a discussion about this earlier this week about um, uh, the last council package was 770 pages so that's a lot of reading and I had to say like we need to we need to cap it we need because people need to come refreshed and informed I usually try like to have my council package completely read by Monday morning uh, they come out Fridays at four our meetings are Wednesdays because that gives me time to digest what I've read and then I have a an agenda meeting with our CAO and some of the staff just to prepare so that uh, yeah, I think this is going to, this question will come up, but, you know, we might end up having to deal with this issue. And then the staff is more prepared as well for the council meeting, and it helps move items forward. And council can ask any question to the agenda package through email, and that's distributed to all uh, members. And then we we um, list those questions out as well at the council meeting, just to try and um, make things efficient. And um, so, yeah, there is quite a bit of work in the background that goes on. And even now, we're uh, I'm learning more about health just because of the need for more health professionals in our in the north and uh, our lack of nurse uh, available nurses. We're dealing with the agency nursing, which is, you know, a big shout out to the people that do this work because we need you. But at the same time, we need people that are going to come to our community and work for the long term. 
So, so yeah, le reading a lot of, you know, the auditor general's reports on different areas. So it's, it's, there's a lot of work in the background. So I probably, for every council meeting, I'm probably looking at at least five to eight hours. Um, we're going to talk about some of the issues here in a few minutes, but I want to ask one for last sure. question here. Yeah. And I've got to ask, how important is it to ask questions during these council meetings? Because I have spoken to many different municipal leaders who, when they first get elected, they're they're kind of timid about asking questions because they don't want to seem like they're, and I'm not quoting anyone here, so don't go back and try to find where I'm quoting this from. But <laughs> they say they might feel like they're stupid. They're, they might be asking a stupid question. And they just don't want to seem like they're asking something that might not have anything to do with the issue at hand, but they think it might have a, a, a influence on how they're going to vote on an issue. How important do you find it to ask all questions as much as they may be quote unquote stupid or something relevant? Because at the end of the day, you have to make those tough choices with the decisions and the questions you ask, right? That's exactly right. And it's important. You So uh, a couple of things here, and I have told my uh, some of my counselors this, when I was on council the night as a counselor, the nights I didn't sleep well, were the nights that I didn't put it out all on the table. Like I, I held back. And the nights that even when it was, uh, you know, there, it created some tension on council or further discussion or it didn't go well, I still went home and slept well because I felt like, you know what, I said what I needed to say. I was thinking these things and I need to get them out there. And, uh, and it's very important to be prepared. And sometimes what I find too is that through the discussion, we, you know, the five of us are having a discussion, I'll think of something that didn't even occur to me before. And that'll happen to other people. So you really want to ask those questions and to put perspective on this, you know, stupid question. Um, I don't believe in that, because you have to give the people sitting at the table some benefit of the doubt. We're sitting there, we're juggling many different things in our mind of on the agenda that we're going to talk talk about some of them might be a contentious issue there might be some underlying factors you don't know and people have all of their own um life going on in the background which isn't always going smooth as well right so sometimes like I know even myself I've I've asked questions and and it's right there in the document <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's just because, um, especially through the pandemic, because I didn't have the staff support right beside me. So I was trying to run meetings on my own and chairing and still trying to get in the discussion. I'm sure some of those meetings, like uh, people might classify some of the questions I even asked as not being the most brilliant. But at the same time, you have to ask them. If you don't know, ask. And if and we can get the information and we can have a discussion about that. But um, yeah, and the other thing too is we want to show that we want to be an inclusive council, right? We want people in the future to run. And, and they have to see themselves in that seat. They have to see, you know, maybe somebody watching on our council or is there with us is thinking that and wants to have that question asked. And you know, that bridges, so you ask the question and they're like, oh, you know, counselor so-and-so asked my question. I was thinking the same thing. So, so yeah, I put it out all on the table, let's discuss it. And you know, some of the best brilliant ideas to move forward come from that type of conversation. You've talked extensively about talking to administration and dealing with the administration aspect of the decision making and what's going on in the agenda package and putting that package together and asking questions. How important is it to do the flip side as well, though? Ask residents. Are residents engaged in horn pain where if you ask them about that contentious issue, that issue that's in front of council, are they willing to give their feedback or is there an apathy that I have noticed in this country, and this is a broad stroke here, uh, 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 an apathy that comes with, as long as my water is turned on and my garbage is picked up, I don't care what's going on at Town Hall. As, just keep my taxes low and I'll be a happy camper. Just do what you need to do. <laughs> when you When you ask residents for their feedback, do you get it? 
Yeah, we do actually. And we've put in, so uh, since I've been mayor, we've put in place, we have regular town hall meetings. Um, we have had mayor's addresses as well. And we do have um, an information portal where you can put in a request or ask questions and that on our website, you can do delegations to council. And we've actually put out many surveys. We've been doing quite a bit of work in our community. So we've had Oh, I think a consultation session probably once a year <laughs> over different topics. The The hardest part about that is being an elected official is when people are coming to you with um, differing views. Maybe they don't uh, like your approach um, and it's and you really need to set that aside and think and ask what is the person's underlying question you know let's let's not get offended let's figure out how do we make win-wins so that they're they're feeling appreciated and heard and then we can move the community forward because whatever the concern the underlying concern it's a valid concern i want to address it sometimes you know they don't like my answer i don't uh, especially with um transparency accountability you know there are certain where where we follow the municipal act and there are certain items that we have to do a closed session. I can't, cannot do it. I have to by law. So, and, um, and that protects the municipality or the people or the negotiations that we're doing. So, and, and I just tell people, you know, we're, um, there's all sorts of avenues. We're the first council that has been completely streamed. Our meetings are streamed. You, the residents get the entire agenda package. So, I think on different items that yes, there's uh, if the item is more contentious, then yes, we get definitely more people out. And I've had to make some tough decisions for our community and council has, uh, you know, we've uh, passed some resolutions that have been quite contentious, but we're seeing the benefit now. So does do the tough decisions get easier to make as time goes on, though? Because you <laughs> must. <t> <laughs> I, I I guess I, I I take from that laugh that is a no, but <laughs> you must be able to you you must be able to get into a groove a little bit and say okay things this is going to be this has to be the way it is because legally with the MGA we have to pass it this way. We might hear from feedback from residents. Do the do, 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 Decision making get easier or is it still as hard when you first got elected in 2016 to this today in 2024? I would say <laughs> that it actually gets more difficult. In the beginning, um, I had a much more optimistic and hopeful <laughs> approach. Um, and then you don't know the breadth and the width of, say, infrastructure issues. And and we're doing our asset management planning and, and getting all of that. And then so you're really seeing the raw data and seeing, oh, you know, this piece of equipment needs to be replaced. And it's, you know, at the tune of, say, a million dollars. And so you... So in the beginning, you're learning and there's a lot more um, just, I guess, blanket optimism. I still have optimism. I'm still very hopeful for my community. But now it's you're. I just understand more fully the complex issues that we're dealing with. So the decisions, um, they do get more difficult because when you're saying yes to something, ultimately you're saying no to something else and you have to say what's the priority. So, and I'll give you an example in our community, we, we opted to sell our ball field. Uh, we have a brand new hotel being built on that piece parcel of land now, which is fantastic, but it was about three years of um, upheaval. And now we're looking at, we're finally relocating the ball field up by the arena. I believe the arena area is going to be a great 365 day hub for our community as uh, we move into the future. But it's that nervousness in the in-between when you're not seeing any boots on the ground kind of action happening. I can see where residents would be like, are these count like, is this council making good decisions on our behalf? And um, so I'm, I'm quite pleased now that the hotel is 60% complete. We're just making the final decisions on the ball field um, relocation. So it's uh, for our new ball field. So, so that was a, a very contentious issue that we went through. 
Um, and rightly so. The community, you know, they were they don't want to see services decline. They want to see them improve and and maybe increase. I want to turn to my second subject now, and I want to talk about horn pain as an entire whole for a few minutes, if you don't mind. And I'm yeah, going to preface no this. I, I love talking about horn pain. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to preface this question because I always do just to make sure people understand that this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not a policy of council. The mayor is one vote on said council. Uh, she has to get a majority of people to vote with her on issues. So this may match up with what the municipality is speaking about right now. But at the end of the day, this is her opinion. With that being said, if you send me your emails, I will respond to them in an appropriate time frame. I have a question for you. In okay. your opinion, Mayor Fort, what is the biggest issue or issues facing horn pain today as of recording this episode? Oh, it's a complex um, group of issues, actually, that one leads into the other. So we do need to diversify our housing stock. And we do need to grow. I would love to see another industry come to our community. We've done a lot of the background work. So and we have our elders and seniors in our community that would like to stay in the community and there's no place for them to relocate to that would be appropriate housing for them. So we do have a housing shortage and in the sense that we have many single family residents, standalone traditional type builds, but we lack um, senior housing in an apartment style. And so then that just leads to a plethora of other challenges people want to move out of the community or they'll try and relocate or we have family members when their parents have to leave and live quite far from the community so it creates loneliness and that sort of thing and I would really rather see our families be able to stay together and have the opportunity to be together so currently that is it's um a huge issue we're having even with our current uh, our Horn Payne Community Hospital, they've had to buy houses to be able to house people when they come into work. Thankfully, with the hotel, that is going to help. They're, they have kitchenette suites, so um, we didn't have a hotel before. So even if you wanted to come and explore the community for work, say, you had no place to really stay to visit for a few days and see if you like the community. So so the hotel will help, and we do. We did create Horn Pain Housing Corporation. They own a 34-unit hotel, so it's an MSC, a Municipal Service Corporation of the township, and um, and their mandate is to deal with uh, housing issues and and to really follow through with the recommendations from our housing needs and demand study that we did in 2019. So. Yeah, because we have really good uh, jobs. We have good work. We have a fully functioning community in the sense that we have three choices for elementary school, a public uh, Catholic French, Catholic English, and then a fully uh, outfitted high school. And um, it's actually the public school is a, a kindergarten to grade 12 school. We have a hospital, a grocery store, a home hardware, and there's opportunity for businesses to grow here. So that would be our biggest challenge right now and um, and finding, uh, just building more homes. So there's a lot to unpack there. And I've got to ask the, the municipal question a little bit here. Housing is not just a municipal issue though. Housing is a developer issue. It's a provincial issue. It's a federal issue. But municipalities like Horn Pain are sort of left holding the bag because you are the frontline government and people expect the municipality to do more. And I'm going to say this a little bit political, but more with less because you're uh -huh. not getting the same grants and you're not getting the same funding that you got from the federal and provincial governments beforehand. What does Horn Pain do in the short term to alleviate some of these issues? Because tomorrow morning you wake up this issue is not going to be gone away magically with a wave of a wand it's still going to be there so give me a silver lining that horn pain is setting themselves up for success not tomorrow but five years 10 years 20 years down the line 
Yeah, definitely. So we are set up for success. So with the Horn Pain Housing Corporation, one of the initiatives we're doing this year, actually on May 11th, we're hosting a housing symposium. Because what we're seeing is that uh, the young people that are coming into our community for different uh, employment opportunities, they don't even necessarily have the tools in their toolkit to understand how to buy a home, like what's an offer to purchase, um, we do have, thankfully, now a real estate agent that works in our community. We didn't have one for years, and she'll be presenting at the symposium as well. But understanding where are the lawyers, how do you make this happen in a community where we don't have the people right, like the brick and mortar offices right in our community. So this will be a, a presentation from the township. How do you buy land from the town? Uh, the community improvement plan, what incentives are in that that can help you? Um, we'll have some financial institutions talking about what a traditional mortgage looks like or a builder's mortgage. How do you get that? What do you need down? And then we have um, some lawyers that will present on what they need. And of course, the real estate agent on looking and what what kind of questions you should be asking when you're buying a home. And then, uh, and we also are, uh, have invited seed homes from Alberta to come out because they do um, pre-made ready homes that can go on a foundation and the uh, build for this type of home is quite short and you can get put in the queue. So that's an option. And there are a few other providers that uh, I actually just had a conversation yesterday with one that could possibly present and they're in Ontario here. So we're looking at what are the avenues that people can use to be able to have a home in horn pain. And, and we're also um, realizing that some of the young people coming from across the country and and outside of the country really want a turnkey home they don't they want to spend their leisure time doing fun activities and and we have so much nature like between snowmobiling in the winter and you know quadding and fishing and that sort of thing in the summer you don't want to be you know renovating homes if that's not your passion so housing, so housing comes with infrastructure out. though Housing, housing comes with infrastructure and you can't yes, yeah. you can't you can't build these houses without the infrastructure uh, underground to build said houses you can build a house if you don't have water to it no one's going to buy that said house um is horn pain set up for the infrastructure growth that needs to come that uh, with these potential growth in uh housing units or housing supply and housing diverse housing uh stock i should say Yes, yes, we definitely do. We have the capacity. So our water and wastewater infrastructure, uh, the, the top end capacity is somewhere around 3,200 people could live in the community. I wouldn't want to max that out, but uh, <laughs> comfortably we could probably go to 25, 2,800. So yes, yeah. Well, and and there are property lots that are available that are fully equipped already with the infrastructure that they need. And um and we're we're upgrading infrastructure actually we have a third avenue project that we're doing and it's and i've been saying this from the beginning i don't want to pave roads unless we're fixing everything underneath i think it's a waste of money to um dig up you know newly paved roads off because there's infrastructure issues underneath so i'm hoping that this project goes really well it's our uh, i believe it's our longest road in the community and we'll be doing that next summer um you've talked about a very macro issue here and housing is a very pressing issue that a lot of municipalities are facing, but yeah. you, you, I'm assuming, and you know, you should never assume, but I'm going to guess that uh, you have been approached by residents across your community that say, my issue is the most important issue to me. That pothole that's in front of my house, that park that needs upgrade, those ball diamonds that you sold, you shouldn't have sold them. How do you balance, and I say you as in the royal you as council, how does council balance the needs of the community and the future growth of the community with the people here and now? Because the here and now want to see that their tax dollars are being spent on them and maybe not for someone 10 years from now to come here and live in their community. How do you balance that and weigh those, those two different uh, groups of passionate uh foresight that you need because you are looking at it as a council and they're looking at it as an individual 
Yeah. So when I first uh, became mayor in 2018, we implemented our first, uh, we did a complete service delivery review first of all of our services we offered. And then we did our strategic plan. We lapped it over one year into the, so that it would fall into the new council and give them some guidance for a year. And then we did our, our next strategic plan, which we do um, give opportunity for the public to put input into it. But really it's a guiding document to show them the residents, this is where we're headed. And if you want some of these items put on the docket into the future, this is how you do it. But you really want to stick to your roadmap because there's so many competing interests. You see new funding envelopes come out and you really want to, tr to try and stick to your plan so that in five years you can look back and say, or in four years you can look back and say, okay, we did accomplish. And um, in my first term as mayor, we accomplished so much. We did all of our, our brand new official plan, a zoning bylaw, which we never had, community improvement plan, We because I saw the need to get us set up for investment. And investors want to have the documents that support whatever business they're bringing to the community. And we were lacking in those documents. We really didn't have a firm foundation of what does Horn Payne even want to be? So we're currently doing a market gap analysis that should be done in the spring. And we just uh, approved our rebranding for the community. So now we're we're moving forward to attract more investment. So my my concern is or when I am approached on these issues, it's where can it fit in now, especially with recreation that is right in our strategic plan that we want to have a comprehensive recreation plan that we're going to do in this term of council. So that is okay, what do we need to put there? What kind of information do we need? If it's other issues in regarding potholes and that I've been very firm. We will continue doing the best we can with what we have, but until we get the dollars to fix that infrastructure underneath, I'm sorry, slow down. Protect your equipment because I'm not going to spend $400,000 paving a road that we're going to dig up. I won't do it. It's a, it's a, it's not a wise investment. And if we can, you know, if we have to delay a year or two before we can do that road, then we do the best we can. And our public work staff does a great job. So, and we had actually this conversation on our March uh, 6th meeting uh, because of the early thaw. <laughs> I, I just was like, uh, are you ready? Are you prepared? Because I think the, you know, the, the possible backlash might start earlier this year and it'll be a longer season of complaining, but. <laughs> I, I like how you but, put it possible, possible. In <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to air quote that for you. The possible <laughs> backlash. As a communications person for a Northern community, I, oh, well, former, I, I know that that possible is never possible. It's always a reality. Um, and, and the thing is, like, we drive the roads too. We see it. You know, it's, it's on my heart to fix it, but it's, I know what's underneath. And our community knows. We've had, <laughs> we've had huge digs in the middle of winter, which is, which is, you know, put stress on the rest of the infrastructure when you're digging at those, you know, minus 30 temperatures. But so thankfully, we've had less and less of those moving into the future, and we should have less as well. Do you have buy-in from the residents on the vision of what you want or you and council want for Horn Pain? The growth, the uh, housing diversity, the uh, diverse housing, the growing, the industrial uh, economic drivers of your community and the elder seniors home. Do you have buy-in from the community? Because yes. councils can go only as far until they can they get pushback from the residents. So do you? Yeah, so when I uh, was first elected in 2018, I actually put out a five point plan of what I wanted to do for the community. I had a full platform and uh, I door knocked and got information from people. And for different areas, we've had like our housing needs and demand study. Um, a consulting firm did that for us, but they had a huge response to their survey. They were so impressed. And we've done some public meetings where um, elders and seniors can come and and express their needs. And and I've had people come right up to me. They, you know, we're living in a home, but we'd really like to get into a nice two bedroom apartment that's accessible. And 
And uh, so they have those conversations one on one as well. And other documents that we've had have all been informed through the public. And I want to give a shout out to this is a real win win. When we first started in 2019, when I was mayor, so that first full year, uh, funding envelope came out for bridges, roads or airports, a council was really looking at roads. We had a huge discussion. There was no uh, money for the water infrastructure, but we could have been able to pave, I think it was a kilometer or something of road at that time, up to that or something. And so we put it out to the public. We said, you know, we're, we're discussing this. We want your feedback. What do you think? And there was a few members of the public that responded and they said, maybe we should look at our airport because we need it for orange for fly in medical service. You know, we rely on this because we are isolated off 11 and 17. We're quite a ways from any major hospitals. So council pivoted. We really looked at it. We looked at our airport and, and we ended up deciding to go with the airport because we could do the complete refurbishment of our airport with um, new ditching and lighting and renovating uh, a new fuel standard, all of that with the funding, whereas we wouldn't be able to do a complete road project with water infrastructure being fixed, right? And that was a win-win. I, I, and, I, and I say that at meetings, like that was um, directed by our citizens and we listened. And, and now we have um, an asset that is, has got a nice long life span on it that isn't as much of a worry as it was when I first became mayor. I want to turn to my last segment now because I'm cautious of time and I know you are a busy mayor and I want to ask about my favorite subject and that is tourism. As I said Yay. in the pre-introduction, pre <laughs> if you come on this show, I come to your community and my husband, myself, and a few of our dogs are going to be making a massive RV trip across Canada this year and we're going to be stopping in Hornpain in August for a quick visit and to see some of these amazing tours of destinations. As we have listeners from around the world and across Canada, what are some of the tourist destinations that you would recommend to people who come to Hornpain? Okay, well, this is exciting for Hornpain. So we are the geographical center of the province. This is uh, actually just in, we're uh, in the process now of um, putting the trail in to the, to the center so people can walk there. It won't necessarily be ready this summer, <laughs> but um, we did do a snowshoe out there just before the pandemic in February of 2020. And, and I held one of the newest horn pain babies right at the <laughs> geographical center of the province. But when you're in horn pain, I think definitely stop at any of the, uh, we have uh, Eats and Treats is a local restaurant here that's run by um, a person that grew up in horn pain, is a local, you'll meet locals there because really, the people make our community. So I would encourage you to um, take a walk. And if there's anything happening up at our arena at that time, you want to go to those places to actually meet people because you'll have some diversified discussion about railroading, forestry, fishing. <laughs> and then if, uh, if you do like the outdoors, of course, we have fishing all across every direction around our community. There's all sorts of quadding trails and uh, you can get out on your um, side by sides there. We do have a provincial park that's just north of us, Nagogamy Seas Provincial Park, which is beautiful. The, the lake is um, it's a beautiful lake to kayak on. You can uh, water ski uh, all sorts of water sports there. And it's uh, and there's some traditional history from the indigenous people that uh, first lived in this area. And there's a rich history there. So I would encourage anyone to take some time. And there's some beautiful hiking trails in that area. So, so yeah, when you come to Horn Pain, it's really find places where you can meet people and talk to people. We have a pavilion park that's downtown right across from Eats and Treats. And um, you can have your lunch out there at the pavilion park. The kids play there. There's a skate park there. There's some exercise activities. And um, and then we have our three bears, of course, the monument for our community. We're the home of the three bears. And that's right down when you're passing through town. It's a great photo opportunity for people. And um, and there are, is also a small park there as well for children to use. 
And another area that's really nice for pets is to uh, Cedar Point Park, which is just south of the community. It's only about maybe a kilometer and a half outside of the community. And there's all sorts of uh, walking areas there. People use that for swimming in the summertime and it's a vast open space and, and dogs are um, allowed there and pets. So, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I try to do a little bit of research on the communities. You have a stop on the Via Rail Trail that goes cross country, and you are sort of dead center, and you are a stop along the Via Rail Trail from Toronto to Winnipeg, correct? Yeah, we are. We are. Yeah. So the Via comes through our community, and um, it's it's overwhelming sometimes because the whole train unloads. They have. Uh, I'm not sure what the time. I think it's just under an hour that they get to spend in our community, and uh, so they're in our stores. They're checking things out. They're walking around, and yeah, and it's and it's. Uh, I also have to say that we do have via rail engineers that live in our community, so it's a trade off point for the employees that work here. So. No, I just wanted to know because I was like, this this seems very like that'd be a big tourism draw, like a random stop along the Via Trail in your community. Who wouldn't want that? Um, yeah, yeah, and I have to say too that um, for years now, I'm not sure if it continued after the pandemic, but uh, a local church group, and I think it was all the church groups on uh, Christmas would give treats and coffee and have. Uh, refreshments for people that were traveling through during the holidays it was yeah it was that Sounds... home, that's why i say it's the people <laughs> it's people in horn pain that make the community like we're we're a fun bunch like this weekend we're having a hockey tournament which we haven't had in a long time you know i'm strapping on skates to play in the four and four <laughs> So it brings me to my last question, and you kind of already answered it just there, but I want to get it on the record fully. What makes Horn Payne such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family, Mayor Fort? Yeah, it's definitely the community itself. It's the people that make it up. Uh, there's such a long history. Because, because of the railway, we've had um, a transient community where people come and stay. They've lived here for 10 years. It's amazing to me how many people have connections to Horn Pain. We still, currently, there's a, a Horn Pain picnic that happens in Barrie, Ontario every year. <laughs> so so it's, the, it's those connections to who's lived here and why they were here and, and providing the services that people need in the community. And then getting together and running events, like the major events in our community are all run by residents here that just want to volunteer. And, and, and I have to say, it's a, we love hockey and curling. So there's that in the winter and, and you have to stay active, right? In the North, in the winter time, we have less sunlight. So you want to get out and do things, but ultimately I have to say it's the people, it's the people that make up the community. Mayor Payne, Mayor Fort, thank you so much. This has been an honest to goodness conversation. I, I I apologize for keeping a little bit longer than originally anticipated, but I truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down and talk about yourself, but the beautiful township of Horn Payne, which I'm so looking forward to visiting later on this year. And hopefully when I do, we can grab a coffee. Yes, well, I was just going to say that it would be my pleasure to meet with you while you're in town and I can show you around a bit. And, and I've had a great time discussing. I love I love discussing the community, but I also just want to see people thrive. So this has been a great morning for me. Now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations like you saw today on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Now, your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last year and a half. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.